Hello, can you hear me okay? <laughs> Welcome. Um, so I guess I'll go ahead and kick this off here. So uh, to start, I'm here to talk today about, oh, I gotta click a lot of stuff. Oh God, this isn't gonna reach back there. So you might need to just click it and I can say, click. <laughs> All right, are you just gonna hit the button over there? Okay, I think that's what we're gonna do. Okay, so today I'm here to talk to you about our observability journey uh, as a company, and as part of that, talk about how we came to standardize on New Relic and perform a global migration of our entire legacy monitoring stack. Uh, next slide. Okay, to start though, I should probably give an introduction. So uh, I'm Justin Hawkins, I'm an engineering lead here or at Riot Games on the Riot Developer Experience team. Uh, for the last eight years, I've been working with engineers and teams across the company to help them build highly scalable and globally available game and platform services. Uh, on the RDX team, we focus on the golden path for service engineering, where we provide teams with a set of best practices, engineering frameworks, tools, and services that minimize the engineering complexity of building large, globally available distributed systems. So, in other words, help engineers build things. All right, so, oh, yeah, click. This is going to get old. Uh, okay, so first off, we should. Oh, that's fine. Uh, we should talk about who is Riot Games. So, as the name would suggest, uh, we're a gaming company. We serve a global player base of millions of players across the world on 40 different data centers, and we run five uh, AAA games currently in production, and quite a few other ones in R&D. So, if you're familiar with Riot Games, it's games like League of Legends, Wild Rift, Runeterra, uh, Teamfight Tactics, and Valorant. So, anyway, those are our games. Uh, next slide. Um, on top of that, we, oh God. Uh, Riot also has a thriving esports league that allows players around the, the world to compete at the game at the highest level. Uh, to kind of put it in perspective, uh, last year, this is I think from the world finals, uh, we had 73 million uh, concurrent watchers of just the finals match alone. So it's kind of on par with the Super Bowl to give you kind of an ideal scale uh, for the sporting event. Uh, next slide. I can't give a Riot Games presentation without throwing this up there. Usually it ends up on a slide or two, but this is our mission statement. It really does drive everything um, that we do at the company. Uh, and so, what we do at Riot Games is we aspire to be the most player-focused gaming company in the world. Next slide. All right, but how does observability support that mission? As a company, we can't focus on our player, uh, click, unless uh, we're able to, <laughs> if we're unable to visualize and understand the pain that they're experiencing. Next slide. All right, so early on in Riot's history, it wasn't at all uncommon for us to rely heavily on lagging indicators for health. Um, you can go ahead and click twice for me. Uh, so things like the number of support tickets um, that were coming in, so kind of like a lagging indicator on are people experiencing pain. Um, even like following Reddit, we have a, a pretty active Reddit ecosystem for the company and so like, early days and even now today, we get a lot of like metrics just by what's the, what the sentiment is for players on a forum such as Reddit. So uh, it's really not a great way to, to run observability. You're kind of like waiting until people see pain to do something about it. Next slide. All right, so just to kind of highlight like why observability is important. Um, without adequate observability in place, you may think you live in a beautiful world like Piltover shown here. Um, but in reality, if you click for me, uh, you might actually behind the scenes have more like the city is on, like things could be decaying and you just don't know. You live in kind of like a, an ignorant bliss where under the, under the hood things could really be falling apart. Uh, next slide. All right, so to solve this problem today, as a company we leverage New Relic, uh, logs and metrics and APM and mobile and pretty much anything that New Relic will give us to use. And we process more than 100 terabytes of observability data every day uh, to provide insight into the player experience. I did the math and I think that's um, three petabytes a month about. Um, engineers throughout Riot have standardized on New Relic for observability needs and we're in a really good spot, but that's not where this journey began. So this, the talk is gonna focus, focus mostly on how we got to this point. Uh, next slide. All right, so how did we get where we are today? Uh, if you click for me. Riot Games started as a company back in 2006. And our first game, if you click, uh, League of Legends launched three years later in 2009. Back then, one of our core engineering values or principles as a company was to move fast. A click. 
The problem with encouraging uh, people and teams to move fast, though, is you're not always moving intentionally or even in the right direction. Everybody's just moving really quickly. Uh, and when you're a new startup, moving fast is usually necessary to avoid running out of runway or kind of, you know, <laughs> running out of time. Um, but once the company starts to scale, that operational burden caused by all those move fast decisions really stack up and can really inhibit your ability to move quickly anymore or intentionally. Um, click. All right, so during that time as a company, as we were moving fast, we managed to produce a ton of internal competing uh, best practices for how we wanted to handle observability. And there were no shortage of observability solutions um, to all of our problems. You can pretty much name any observability piece of tech, and I can probably guarantee you a team at Riot use it. Um, and much of that ownership burden for like navigating all of that, that technical complexity fell to our operations team. Um, they were trying to support the game, and we were asking them to watch and monitor a multitude of observability platforms to do so. So it was kind of up to them to, to like layer value on top of all of this complex ecosystem. And on the fortunate side, um, not every th technical decision we made uh, around that time was a bad one or made our lives more difficult. Um, one of the good things about working at a highly collaborative company is the things that add value and are really useful eventually do get adopted. Uh, it just takes a little bit of time. If you click for me. And so one of those that was adopted, or that we, a decision we made that paid off for us was deciding to standardize on this minimal set of service APIs. So for us, this was like a metrics and a logs endpoint that we'd ask every microservice to implement. Uh, the idea being that your service could scrape, like we, had, we could scrape that data and get observability um, data back for all of the thousands of services that were, that were running. So it was kind of the contract that we asked everybody deploying to our ecosystem to align with. Um, if you click for me. And so we were able to leverage that for our company's first attempt at building a, like a global observability pipeline. Um, unfortunately though, kind of like every other tech decision we made around the time, it was built in house and put together and we decided like, well, we, you know, we hire a lot of smart people and it'd be really awesome to build something like that. So, so we've, we started a, a data team that built a um, observability pipeline internally. Um, and that actually caused uh, a lot of problems for us if you click. Um, all right, so the first problem with this was it was an additive solution. This was another thing on top of all of our other uh, pieces of tech, if you don't mind clicking for me. Um, it didn't get rid of any of the observability platforms or anything else that we had. That we had. It was just another thing on top of stuff. It was, it was awesome because it was global and it provided global insight, but we still had all of the other complexity. If you click for me. Uh, the other problem was that it didn't scale well or handle outages effectively. Um, in an observability platform, everybody here knows this, but I'm just going to kind of reiterate it. Live data right now is worth so much more than past data. Data from an hour ago, data from two days ago. Like, you want all that data to answer questions, but if you don't know if your game or your service is up live right now, like, you're not doing your job. Like, that's, that's what we need to operate. Um, if you click for me. And so what would happen is this pipeline that we built, um, you know, it, it leveraged... Uh, the Elk stack, which is a great stack, but it, it wasn't set up to handle this use case internally. So we would get lag where there would be an event, and all of a sudden we would be an hour, two hours behind because of the amount of traffic coming in, um, and we would have to kind of churn through this backlog to get back to live state. So we're always trying to catch up. Uh, if you click for me. All right, so for all these problems, we tried a couple different things to, to solve them. The first one was um, with all of the all of this complexity, technically, we try to layer on a, like a UI on top of it to give us a better um, un unified feel that kind of masked all the complexity. If you click for me. Um, but that was kind of the problem is we still had everything else there. We were just trying to like, you know, like showing here, like sweep it under the rug and make it seem like a great, great ecosystem. But like for the teams operating it, the teams trying to leverage this data, there is still a ton of complexity. If you click for me. All right, so around this time, as we were trying to build a global pipeline and get everything to scale and figure out how to operate, uh, we started to go through one of our biggest internal transitions as a company. And for us, that was about four years ago, we uh, started our, our move to being a multi-game studio. So we were no longer going to be the League of Legends company. We were going to be you know, a, a, a games company that, that shipped multiple games. Um, and we knew that our internal observability platform was already at the limits of scale. Uh, it required regular maintenance daily to keep it up and active, a team of engineers just to keep the lights on for it. Um, and on top of that, every new game was 
solving observability on their own. Like there was, we didn't have a, a really good structure or standard that we were asking games to follow in order to ship. So it was just kind of stacking more things on top of the rest of the problems we had. If you click for me. All right, so how do we go about solving that problem? Click. Uh, the first thing we did was uh, fund a team internally at the company that owned our cohesive strategy for observability. So talked to a lot of leaders throughout the company, a lot of engineering teams, and kind of advocated for this approach of, hey, can we take everybody's observability stack under our umbrella, and we'll come up with a, a path forward, a, a way to, that we want to actually move. Uh, if you click for me. All right, so that was us centralizing the ownership. If you click again. Um, after we had kind of like taken ownership under our scope, we did a vendor analysis to evaluate build versus buy options for potential strategies for observability. So we wanted to know, is it some, should we build something in-house uh, or improve what we have or should we start to talk to vendors? So doing that involved doing a number of proof of com concepts where we wanted to um, partner with the vendors early on to kind of build out the platform and see how things would work, kind of test the limits of scale. Um, the other thing that we did was work with all of our game teams and all of our platform teams to figure out like what everybody wanted out of observability. There's so many different ways that you can solve it. You can decide to standardize on APM and open tracing or logs or metrics um, or you kind of kind of you name it. Like you have different things you prioritize. So what we did was we, we surveyed the whole company, figured out what was important and assigned like a scoring so we could figure out when we we're looking at all these vendors, which vendor best solved our problem. Um, the other thing though with, uh, with choosing a vendor that I will say is not every vendor is gonna solve your problems perfectly or will be ready for you. And so to kind of give you an example, we wanted, we really highly prioritized logging for our, our platform. Four years ago when we started this evaluation, New Relic logs wasn't globally available. Like it was a work in progress, it was beta, it was learning how to scale. Um, but we knew that like that partnership with the vendor was critical to being successful because over time observability is gonna evolve. And as everybody probably knows, once you start integrating with an observability platform, it's really hard to shift the entire company over to something different. So it's really good to have a good relationship there. Uh, if you click again for me. Um, so once we had aligned on a vendor, we started to work on our migration strategy. And so if anyone here has ever run a global tech migration for a company, you're well aware of how challenging that can be. Uh, so for us, we run a 24 seven service. And when you run a all the ways up service, there's not a, ever a good time to disrupt your live service team to try a new platform or to do something. Like they're generally not a fan of it. Um, and the second thing is when you do a migration, teams are really busy because you're gonna have to ask game teams or service teams to integrate in some way to, to move into the new stack. Um, and so it's almost impossible, usually unrealistic, to get teams to prioritize that kind of work because it's sort of a distraction to all the value they wanna add. So uh, if you go to the next slide. So our approach to solving this was to try to make uh, the whole move to a new platform as invisible as possible to the customer. If you click for me. Uh, the, one of the first things we did was we updated many of our core libraries and services uh, to forward fix things. So kind of like stopping the bleeding, we wanted all new tech being shipped to start being on the new platform as early as possible because that was one less thing we'd be forced to migrate later on. If you click again. <clears throat> the other thing we did was we built shim services. So this is for the data in particular. Uh, we wanted to give people a chance to get to test for data parity and to explore the new data in New Relic. So we built a, a layer on top of those service APIs I discussed earlier that would send data continually to our existing platform, but also start to seed and funnel data into, into New Relic. Um, if you click for me again. So once we had all that data, that allowed us to start doing something with alerts as well, because it's great to have all the data, but alerts are a big part of the way we operate. Um, and so we actually, um, made a few other good, like useful tech decisions around this time too, and that was to uh, allow us to define alerts as code. So what that let us do was uh, start to, just like metrics and just like logs, start to funnel and tee alerts into New Relic. Um, one of the problems though with funneling, like teeing alerts is you have two alerts. Uh, if you go to the next, or if you click again. Uh, this quote by Jack Handy I love because this illustrates alert fatigue pretty much perfectly. Uh, if you spam people, uh, it says if trees could scream, would we ever, would be so cavalier about cutting them down. We might if they screamed all the time for no good reason. Um, and alerts are very much the same way. If your alerts go off all the time, like game teams or platform teams or whatever will start to look for how to silence the alerts or how to mute them or how to bucket them. And usually like improving the quality of the alerts or something like comes, comes later. They just kind of assume there's a problem with the platform. Um, if you go to the next slide. All right, so 
Once we had full data parity, the final step was to transition the company uh, and engineers and operators' workflows into New Relic. Uh, so if you click, um, that involves setting up access for all the teams and individuals to, to New Relic. Um, I will say, I'm not going to go into that in great detail, but sub-account management and user management in New, in New Relic is, for us, continues to be one of those things that we, we struggle to do well. We have a ton of sub-accounts and teams, so it's like, if you have a dashboard that spreads across graphs, you need to be able to allow people to get to the thing they need. And so we almost have people whose full-time job it is to grant access. So we're improving that by adopting things like Okta and moving towards SSO that New Relic now has. But I would say we greatly underestimated the amount of work it would take to give people access to the right data. Um, after that, though, we, we focused on migrating critical dashboards because that's the other thing is people get really used to their dashboarding tool. Like it takes, there's a learning curve to figuring out how to get value out of it. Um, and so we didn't want to ask everybody to just go in and start from nothing for dashboarding because it was kind of a non-starter for a lot of people that were used to using, um, you know, Grafana or whatever to, to do, do their dashboarding. So again, we kind of took the make it invisible approach and wrote some scripts that would migrate dashboards out of our current platform into New Relic for teams and add, give all the right level of access. Uh, idea being that on people on teams' first day into New Relic, they could log in and see their data as they were used to seeing it. Like it would look a little different, but everything was there. Uh, if you click. All right, so at this point, we had pretty close to 100% data parity between our old platforms and New Relic. Um, and we began to schedule deprecations to shut down the numerous existing observability platforms. Uh, and so turning off any platform can be really unnerving. But my advice there is to give customers as much notice as possible um, and to repeat that message as often as you can to avoid surprises. If you click for me. Uh, and then click one more time. Um, and even after you like socialized everybody, uh, I guarantee some people are still gonna act surprised or be surprised because not everybody reads the email or they forgot about it or you name it. Um, so just be ready for that and then still follow through on the legacy shutdown. There's gonna be a lot of temptation to keep the old thing up just in case or the one team that doesn't have time to learn how to do the thing. Uh, but I would say set the date, keep repeating the date and then when the date comes actually shut things down. Uh, we fell victim to leaving things up way longer than they needed to be. And the reality is when we turned some of those things off, nobody really cared because we thought they were more valuable in some cases than people did. But I would say that's, that's one big part of it is just make sure you keep repeating the message because people are, people don't like the, people are very sensitive to their observability data and their platforms. So you need to kind of like help them through it. Um, next slide. All right, so now we're at today. We're kind of back where we started. And as a company, we leverage New Relic to operate more than 10,000 services uh, that support millions of players 24-7 across the globe. Uh, and the cool thing is, as new games come online, they don't really worry about like how they're gonna operate their platform or how, where their data's gonna go. Like It's kind of a, a solved problem in the company. Um, and instead of focusing on that, they get to focus on more interesting questions, like how do I answer better questions with that data, or how can that data tell a better story about the, the user's experience? Next slide. All right, so, to discuss the next, a different part in more detail around SLIs and SLOs, uh, I was planning to welcome Max Stewart to the stage. I put him up here anyway to shame him a little bit if he's watching the stream. Um, he actually got sick over the weekend, so he's not gonna be here, so you're stuck with me. Um, but uh, if you click for me. Um, so anyway, so <laughs> he's not here. But, <laughs> but that's okay. So uh, what we're gonna do now, though, is move into um, a part, if you click one more time, that I'm pretty excited about. Uh, we have Alex Schmidt here, who's our expert services, uh, principal technical account manager for New Relic, who really worked with us to, I think, do the POC and also transition us into New Relic. So he's, he was with us from the New Relic side on the journey. Um, and then you have myself, who also was there helping to bootstrap a lot of that. And then as well, I have James Glenn, who I might pull up here, who's an engineer that worked with me very closely on the project, doing more of the, like, actually making the migration work happen. So. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna stop the talking part, but open it up to Q&A. Um, anything really goes if you have questions about tech or if Riot Games is hiring and the answer is yes um, or whatever. Um, so yeah, feel free. Sorry, do you want a mic on the question or do you want me to? I don't know if you need it for the stream. That's an excellent point. I'll be running around handing the mic to whoever you pick. Oh, thank yeah, thank you. Good context. Hello. It works. Um, so originally, I was in uh, our expert services division when I, uh, like, back in October 2019 at this point, um, 
was kind of signed as a contract to help out RDXOP team, Justin's team, to basically help migrate everything over from Elastic to, to New Relic. So uh, in, in a services role, it was a super interesting problem because like we're going from like on-premise to all New Relics and our logs and metrics APIs were all beta at that point. So it was super interesting at the time and Justin's team was like super inviting. So basically got to embed with their team like in their daily standups and everything and like help them uncover any problems they had with New Relic. Um, like for example, the, the very first thing that I did was going on site um, with the Legends of Runeterra team, Max Stewart um, was there. So I was literally sitting next to their first team that was moving over to New Relic and like hearing it firsthand from their engineering manager, like, okay, we need to have this visualization that we currently have in Grafana. How do we do this in New Relic? Helping them out with all the different query languages, things like that. Um, so basically, like it was overall very good experience and I would basically encourage all of you to lean heavily on your uh, technical account teams. Like we're all here to help you as much as possible. Um, we've since kind of shifted from more offering like paid services that we do now to actually giving you like a technical technical account manager to help you out with all of your needs. So basically, long story short, leverage your technical resources. We're here to help. Yeah, I want a big plus one to that. If you have, an, if you have New Relic and a big presence of it, you're doing a migration, uh, without having somebody like Alex work with your team directly closely, you're gonna miss out on a ton of potential value and it'll be a lot harder on yourself. So. I would say like it's almost like a required asset to have if you're going to do a migration at this scale. Um, so if you're if you're not this, I, they didn't ask me to sell this. I'm I'm serious. Like it, it's it's a really good piece of the of the partnership. So make sure if you can, you take advantage of it. But uh, go figure. Observability is hard. I mean, you need help. Thank you. First of all, thank you for the talk. It was great. Um, I want to take you back to the beginning where you said that without observability, everything could seem peachy, but beyond, you know, under the hood, it's actually decaying and, and breaking down. Do you happen to have an example of something like that and how you were able to leverage observability to come up with, not with something that's clearly broken, but something that would be broken if you don't do anything proactively? Yeah, I mean, Yes, so this kind of goes back to the support ticket thing that we had that I mentioned earlier. Like a lot of times it won't, wouldn't be till somebody starts reporting, hey, I have problems. And one of the things that we monitor is like latency. So if players are in game, um, you know, are they experiencing any like lag or what's, what's their actual experience like? And so the support ticket might look like, hey, I lost my ranked game or whatever. Like it's not a very useful ticket. It tells us like somebody had a problem. We have to see enough of that like those kind of requests to be like, oh, there's probably a problem in LADAM or in Amsterdam or something like that because we see a lot of people that are complaining about, um, you know, lag or about, you know, things that are causing them to lose games or whatever. Um, and so where observability helped with that is like to actually instrument for, for latency in all these regions. Like, and there's a lot, of, a lot of that goes into like getting data you need from the ISP and actually I could probably pull in somebody from the right direct team who could talk more to that from the right side or if you're interested afterwards, but, um, but yeah, that latency data, like actually being able to watch that, then know like what's normal for each region, because it's not vanilla across the board. Like some, there's different hops you go through for different data centers. So you really have to ha use like a feature like baseline alerting or whatever to figure out like what makes sense as a threshold for the player's experience related to that. Uh, but that's one that we definitely use heavily now instead of kind of, again, waiting to find out later that people have problems. Cool, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. I suspect when you started, you wanted to address your principal pain points at the beginning. Now that you've begun to understand New Relic and its platform, are there other places within your operation that'll be useful to you, and how can you build on that? So the question is, are there other places that New Relic could be useful to, like the, the pain for operating services within the company? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'd say like like one feature or something we're not taking advantage of in New Relic is like deployment markers or the ability to like actually connect an event that happened operationally to the state of the game or the service. Uh, we have that data kind of scattered around and it kind of re like relies on our ops group or um, operators to figure out, um, you know, 
what might have happened correlated time-wise with an incident we're seeing, whereas if we use a feature like deployment markers, right when a thing happens, we know that a thing is happening. So we can correlate uh, direct events. So that's probably the bigger one, is, is getting more like uh, signals from our, like the work developers are doing, because I would say, and this is probably true for most people, the most stable time that we ever have as a company is when nobody's doing any work. Like when people aren't doing deploys, or it's the weekend, or it's the holiday, uh, because most outages are caused by some kind of event, like a change that went in through the system. So that's probably one where we get the most value out of that we're kind of like waiting on. Thank you. Where in the deployment cycle do you get engineers to turn on alerts and dashboards? Is it before production? Is it when they're in production? Same with SLOs, is that after a little bit of time into production, like how fast do you move? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, so it sort of depends on the team, which isn't gonna be a great answer and the diligence they wanna do engineering wise. Like um, there's nothing that would prevent them from not thinking about that problem all the way to when they ship to production. But like ideally they don't do that because that's not a great way to do engineering. You really wanna test all that ahead of time. But as far as like building alerts and dashboards, I would say most teams, when they start to move into um, like, like alpha testing for a game or whatever, and, they're, and they actually want to monitor the health of it, that's when they start to kind of answer the questions about how do we know if this is healthy. Um, that's actually one of the things that Max is sort of working on from, the, from Riot's perspective. We have a team called like Production Engineering, but they're trying to come up with the core set of answers that every game needs to be able to sort of um, like answer when they want to ship. So what are the key metrics that a game should have to know that represent the player's experience. So that's one where um, most of our monitoring is gonna move, transition more towards like those key questions we wanna make sure are answered. But for individual services, it'll probably still fall back on the, the service operator, or the development team to figure out like when they wanna start to instrument alerts. But typically it's too late in the cycle is what I would say. When you switched to New Relic and had to change all of your alerting over, did you have to do anything other than just changing the queries to the new New Relic system, or did you have to reconfigure how you did the, the, the entire process in any way? Yeah, so we, we had to change a number of things to, to have it tie into our operational platform. So we leverage uh, like an alert um, aggregator that, I know New Relic has a thing like that, but we use, uh, you know, we use like Big Panda to kind of collect all of our data, but using that requires getting the data and the alerts to there. So uh, this kind of goes back to the alerts as code that I mentioned. Because we're transforming the alerts uh, into New Relic from this baseline definition that we had, it's kind of similar to like Terraform, uh, we were able to insert in all of the requirements for our alerts. Like so we were able to layer in another uh, like a notification channel or whatever to the alerts to make sure the data when it fires gets triggered and goes to uh, goes to Big Panda. So that's probably the, the main thing we had to do. There's a lot of other stuff too that I will say for the whole data pipeline and the uh, metrics, or sorry, the alerting and stuff like that, uh, they're all tied to a sub account. So a big part of the system that we built was trying again to route data where it needs to go to kind of provision access. So that, that relates to alerts as well. Uh, and so kind of while I'm talking about that, some of the challenges that you can sort of look for is as data spreads across different sub accounts, um, it's, it, it, can, it can become kind of hard to navigate and manage all of that from the user's perspective because they'll have questions about where is this thing configured. So New Relic 1 helps with a lot of that, I would say, but there's still like, with like logging or something like that, you have to really know where to go and find your data. So as part of the migration, if you're moving data in, you need to have a, a pretty good answer for like how will teams find out where their service data is and, and what sub account. Uh, unless your approach is to like have everybody manually construct their own sub account, but um, kind of kind of on that while I'm on a tangent, um, something that if you give people too much control over their sub accounts in your relic across the company, you're going to lose out on a lot of standards, like how even simple things like how sub accounts get named, or how do how do you know who the owner is of the sub account and stuff like that. So um, so yeah, so kind of back to the the alerts question. There was like a lot we had to do logistically overhead to make sure that. The data, like the data, made sense. We knew who was the owner and all that. So it's a lot of work around that. Sorry, the mic. 
Hi. So just for clarification, because I got a little bit confused, before transitioning to New Relic, you guys had an in-house built solution or you used a different vendor? We, well, it was a different, it was an in-house built solution okay. leveraging Elasticsearch. So like we operated okay. like a thousand node cluster of Elasticsearch nodes internally. Um, so it was kind of like leveraging another vendor but operating it in-house. Gotcha, thank you. Any other questions? Otherwise, you all will get a couple of minutes back. All right, thank you so much. Appreciate everybody's time. Thank you so much, Justin.